Good morning, church. We are excited to be here this morning and worship with you. Um, just a few things. Um, if you are a guest, please um, visit us at the Information Center, and there's some information about the church and a gift for you. Um, at the end of your rows is the friendship register. Um, please fill that out so we can get a record of attendance. But also, if you have any prayer requests, um, or praises, uh, we would love for you to write those down, and um, we are a praying church, so we would love to pray for you. Um, so if you are able, would you please stand and join us for worship? a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy is wide, because you're good on your promise.
thank you for your goodness, your kindness to us. We love you so much. God, help us to build our life on you. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of all the effort we can bring to lift high your name. You are good. Receive our worship this morning as we continue to praise you. Worthy of every song we could ever bring. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we do. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
God, we thank you so much for the foundation that we have in Christ. In Christ alone, our hope is found. God, you're so good. You're so worthy of praise. We thank you that as we build our lives on your love, on your word, on the foundation of Christ, we have nothing to fear. The storms still come. The winds still blow. But when we've built our life on you, we're not shaken. We're not scared. We bring all of that to you, God. Thank you for meeting with us here today. God, I pray that as your word is, is taught and preached and spoken over us, that you give us ears to hear, hearts that are soft this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, church. We still have trouble filling in the center section. See, I make the elders sit up front here. That's why Bob is up here. <laughs> Not true. We're in a, a study in Genesis chapters 1 through 11 called The Beginnings. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. The beginnings. Today we're going to look at the beginning or the first ark and the first flood. The first ark and the first flood. I want to begin with, um, well, an admission. I made a mistake last week. Can you imagine that? Pastor made a mistake. I implied from verse 3 of chapter 6 that man's days will be cut off before they get to 120 years. I kind of made that a dogmatic statement that nobody lives after 120. And then Pete Albert writes me this week and says, I'm just reading along in 2 Chronicles, and I found this man by the name of Jehoiada who lived to be 130. <laughs> So that's found in 2 Chronicles 24, 15. So I uh, looked it up quickly, and sure enough, he lived to be 130. So I had to write back to Pete and say, I repent in dust and ashes. I did not say that. <laughs> I just said, good catch. So I went back to my, uh, my professor, Dr. Salehammer, who wrote the commentary, and I read carefully what he said. And he never said men will stop at 120. It's kind of like a comparison, he said, between the previous chapter and chapter 5 where they lived long ages to now to a shorter life expectancy of around 120. Not a hard and fast rule that nobody can live past 120. So there you go. My first mistake in the pulpit ever. <laughs> okay, Lord, I'll confess that later. But we are looking at Genesis chapters 6, 7, and 8 today. I'm going to go through, uh, well, two chapters, half of 6, half of 8, and all of 7 in uh, 45 minutes. Uh, believe me, I can get it done. If you've got notes, you can stay on track as I speed read through this passage. No, I'm not going to speed read it. I'm only going to highlight some key things that I want you to see that God is emphasizing through his word. Uh, when Words repeat themselves or ideas repeat. God is making a statement to us. It's in a very important passage, this Noah passage, because uh, in the New Testament, we're looking at the end times, and the end times compares what's going to happen in the end times to what happened in the days of Noah. And so I want to explain to you why these three chapters are very important. When you think of the 11 chapters that we're going to look through in the beginnings, the largest chunk of passage is this, three chapters on the flood. And why is this so important? Hopefully it'll become clear as we go through the word of God. Keith's already prayed, but I'd like to start again. Lord, we come before you and I just ask that you would bring to my mind the thoughts that you had me study to share 
Take away anything of my own flesh that comes into this message, and may the word of God be clear. May we understand the importance of why you sent the flood. But may we see you, God, with all your attributes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I left off last week around verse 13, so if you have a Bible and you're looking at the first book of the Bible, Genesis, if you don't have one, grab the one in the seat in front of you, there should be a Bible in the rack, and turn to page 4, and you'll find Genesis 6. In verse 13, then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, and its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. That means length, width, and height. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top. And set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with a lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. You They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind and of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all the food which is edible and gather it to yourself and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. My theme this morning is uh, rather simple. It's this, God saved lives and God destroyed lives. He saved lives and God destroyed lives. There's a bad theology in Christian world, uh, even in the church, that says that God is a God of love. He would not kill, he would not destroy. The idea is that God loves mankind. He would never take life. That's bad theology. It's true that God's a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. And the scripture is clear that he's also a God of wrath. And today we're going to see good theology, which is God saves, but also God destroys. So in what I just read, verses 13 through 22, if you notice, in verse 13, it says, God said, and everything that follows until you get to verse 22 is God's voice. This is all one monologue of something that he said. Then you have Noah obeying in the last verse. And God commanded Noah to build an ark. He commands him. And in verse 13, we see God's reason for building the ark. The reason is that he is going to destroy all flesh. It says in the verse that the earth is filled with violence. If you go back to verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Evil. If you skip down to verse 11, it says the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. He sees the world filled with corruption, and the earth was filled with violence. And verse 12, God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And it's 13 says, the end of all flesh has come before me. God has made up his mind that it's time to end this creation that he made that we covered in the first few chapters of Genesis. God looked and flesh, all of it's come before him and he's going to act. 
And in verses uh, 14 through 16, we see God's building instructions. What are the materials? Well, he says, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. (laughs) What is that? Gopher wood. Well, actually, the term is trees of gopher. Okay, that helps out a whole lot, doesn't it? What's a gopher? It's an animal. No, it's not talking about the animal. This is a Hebrew word that only appears once in all of the Old Testament. And they don't even give you a translation of it. They give you what's called a transliteration of it. It's really the the letters G, P, H, what's the last one? Uh, Gopher, or R. (laughs) So it's saying gopher. We're, We're not sure what it is because we can't compare it to anything else in Scripture. It's a transliteration. So therefore, uh, some translations maybe have cypress wood, but really we just don't know what kind of wood it is. We know it's wood. The materials are wood. And he's to take this wood and he's to make this ark. And the word ark there is a, is a Hebrew word that kind of means chest or box or it can be a basket. No, uh, Moses, remember in Exodus chapter 2, they put him in a basket, floated him in the Nile River? That's the same word, ark. It means something that holds life. But it doesn't tell us exactly what it looks like or what it's, we know it's to be made out of some kind of wood. And then it uses the word pitch. Put the pitch inside and outside of it and That word pitch in Hebrew is only used one time too, so we're not actually sure what it is. Remember that silly commercial where you put this special, uh, you put this liquid or something on a boat that's got all these holes in it and it can float on the water? What's what's the name of that stuff? There you go. (laughs) It might have been Flex Seal. (laughs) We have no idea what this word pitch means. So I'm going to use that now, flex seal, put that in my margin of my Bible. (laughs) But we're told the dimensions of the ark, 300 cubits. Now, a cubit was always measured from the tip of your middle finger to your elbow. And commonly, it was thought to be 18 inches. Depends on how big you are. It might be a little, your cubit might be a little bit, but we'll say 18. So if it's 18 inches, a cubit is a foot and a half. And so 300 makes it 450 feet. 450 feet long. A football field is 300 feet. So it's one football field and a half a football field long. That's how long the ark was. It goes on to say it's, it's also 50 cubits, meaning 75 feet wide. And 30 cubits high, 45 feet high. It tells us here it's got a window. One cubit from the top. But again, this window is only used one time of all scripture. We're not even sure it means window. It might be just an opening. Some translations put the word roof there. But there's an opening, some kind of opening. And there's a door that's on its side. And there's three decks, a lower, a middle, and an upper. Three decks, one opening at the top, one cubit from the top, 18 inches from the top, many rooms, many compartments. What does it look like? Well, in, uh, where's this place? It's called um, Williamstown, Kentucky, the Ark Encounter. They built one that's 300 cubits by 50 by 30. That is Noah in front of the ark. That's my grandson, Noah. (laughs) So my grandson, Noah, is, and he's, look at him. He says, do I really got to be in this picture for, yes, you're Noah. You got to be in front of the picture. So there's Noah and the ark. That's what it looks like to be 300 feet long, to be 45 feet high. And the width of it, you can't see from this side view, the width is 75 feet wide. The ark. Okay, you got a picture of the ark? If you look back in chapter 5, very last verse, it says, Noah was 500 years old when he became the father of these three boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
And if you look at chapter 7 and verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, we have now the floodgates of the sky are opened up and the flood starts. 100 years probably to build this boat, this ark. 100 years. So that's the building instructions. That's the ark. Many rooms in this ark. And in verse 17, we have what's called God's covenant plans. It even uses the word covenant in this passage. First in verse 17, God says, I, even I, emphasizing it, I'm bringing a flood of water. It's a promise to destroy all flesh with a flood. Everything will perish, it says in that verse. Everything that is on the earth will perish. Plant life, tree life, animal life, insect life, mankind, everything is going to perish on the earth. Verse 18, God gives a promise to save life. Those who enter the ark will be saved. He says, I will establish my covenant with you. The you is Noah. And you shall enter the ark. Not only you, but your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind to keep them alive. Verse 9, to keep them alive, male and female. Of the birds after their kind, the animals after the kind, every creeping thing on the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep alive. The emphasis is on life, not death, but life to keep alive. And it tells us that Noah is to go get food that's edible. So therefore, if it's edible, that excludes broccoli, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, all those things that are not edible are not allowed on the ark. <laughs> well, I'm not Noah. Everything that's edible, bring on for food. That's the ark. That's all the instructions that God's giving, and we have Noah in verse 22, obeyed. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. The word did, he did is twice, emphasizing he obeyed. 100 years. How much of that 100 years is told about the actual construction of the ark? How much scripture is given to the actual construction? Nothing. For a hundred years, nothing. He just obeyed. He did. That's why in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned about things not yet seen. He, he has not yet seen this flood come, but he obeys and he builds the ark. He does it by faith. God commanded Noah to build an ark. And now in chapter 7, God commanded Noah to enter the ark. The time to enter the ark had come, it tells us in verse 1. The Lord said to Noah, enter the ark. And then he tells him about who enters, you, your household. And here's the reason. For you I have seen to be righteous before me in this time, in this generation. The Lord saw Noah to be a righteous man. It told us that back in verse 9 of chapter 6. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Like his great-grandfather, Enoch, he walked with God. Enoch, if you remember back in chapter 5, the Lord took him to glory. He did not see death. Everybody else in that chapter died, but Enoch, he did not see death because he walked with God. And now we have a man by the name of Noah who walked with God, and he also will not see death because he walked with God. 
So the Lord told Noah to enter the ark with his family. And here in verses 2 and 3, he's commanded now to take of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female. And of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. Also the birds of the sky, meaning of the clean ones, by sevens, male and female. And again, we have this focus on keeping offspring alive on the face of the earth. And the Lord says, for after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. So Noah, you are to enter, you are to take in sevens of all the clean animals and birds, and seven and twos of all the unclean animals, birds, and creeping things. And Noah did, in verse 5, he obeyed again according to all that the Lord had commanded him. And the text says he was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. 600 years old when the flood came. In verse 7, it talks about their entering. In verse 8, we talk about the, of the clean animals, meaning they entered. And then the animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, they entered the ark by twos to Noah as God had commanded him. And it came about after the seven days that water of the flood came upon the earth. Rain started to fall in verse 12. For 40 days and 40 nights. It tells us in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the skies were open. It gives us the exact day. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 27th day, jump ahead to chapter 8, verse 13. Now it came about at the 601st year. So now it's, he's 601 years old. And if you look at verse 14, it says, in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. So Noah was in the ark with his family, with those animals, the clean ones and the unclean ones, for one year exactly to the day. He was in the ark. The time inside the ark lasted exactly one year. If you look at verse 13 through 16, again, we're, we're told a repeat of all the flesh with the breath of life entered the ark. At the end of verse 16, we're, we're reading in chapter 7 that the Lord himself shut them in. My version says the Lord closed it, probably meaning the door behind him. They're all in the ark, and now the seven days are ended, and the flood starts to come in verse 17. The flood came upon the earth for 40 days. I imagine people began to run to the ark at that time. I imagine as the water started to come up upon the earth, people started to bang on the ark for entrance. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and did not spare, meaning end for if God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Here it calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, I'm going to be picking up a little bit into the verse when it says, when the, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. But look at the patience of God. How many years did it take roughly to build this ark? A hundred. And during the construction of the ark for a hundred years, it says that Noah is a preacher of righteousness. And during that hundred years, it tells in 1 Peter 3, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. The patience of God. God is patient. The ark has taken a hundred years. 
He's out there preaching about righteousness and how many people outside of his own family believed and entered the ark? None. And I imagine that when the rain started to come and the flood started to come upon the earth, that now they're wanting to get into the ark. But guess what? It's too late. Judgment has fallen. It reminds me of a passage that Jesus told in the New Testament shortly before he went to the cross. And he says, let me tell you a parable about these 10 virgins, these 10 young women who are waiting for the bridegroom to come. The bridegroom is out and he's going to come back and they are to wait. And they're to have their lamps ready to go to light the way when the bridegroom comes. And five of them did not have enough oil in their lamps to wait that long. And five did have enough oil. And so they get the news. The bridegroom's on his way. He'll be here shortly. They light their lamps and five of their lamps went out and didn't have enough oil. Five had enough oil. So the five ladies that said, hey, we don't have enough oil share with us that we and they said we can't if we share with you then we'll run out too go buy some and when they went to buy some the bridegroom had come the five had their lamps ready waiting for the bridegroom they entered into the feast and the door was shut the five come back they're knocking on the door they want to enter and the lord said i do not know you it was too late The flood is coming. It's too late. You had a hundred years to get right with God. Now it's too late. But God was patient. And Noah's a preacher of righteousness. But when God's judgment falls, it's too late. It's too late to repent. And in verses 18 to 24, it talks about the water. First, the water came on the earth. Now the water is prevailing on the earth. In fact, that word prevailed occurs four times. In verse 18, in verse 19, in verse 20, and in verse 24. In verse 18, the water prevailed. Now the ark starts to float. In verse 19, the water prevailed, and now the mountains are covered. In verse 20, the water prevailed, and it's higher, 15 cubits higher than the highest mountain. A worldwide flood. And in verses 21 to 23, it's a pretty sad narration. Because it says, all flesh that moved on the earth perished. All flesh. Birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. All mankind. Men, women, elderly, and even the youngest of young. Of all that was on dry land, all whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. Thus he, meaning God, blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth. Except only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. And the water prevailed on the earth for 150 days. Back then they looked at months as being 30 days, so this is five months. The water's prevailing for five months over the whole earth. That's how the chapter ends. Praise the Lord for chapter 8, but God. But God remembered Noah. And in verses 1 to 12, we see that the water subsided, receded, and decreased. 
God remembered. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. God caused the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky to be closed, were closed. And God caused the rain from the sky to be restrained. It was restrained. And the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. Another five months. In the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. Where's that? Well, maybe a map would help us. (laughs) The map doesn't come with that little oval there. I think Peter added that for us. The mountains of Ararat, there's not just one mountain, it's a range of mountains right there. Right now, that area today is Armenia. Right above the letter A in that section is what's called Georgia. To the left is Turkey. To the south is Iran. To the right is Abij something, (laughs) long name. The mountains of Ararat is where the ark came to rest. And it goes on to tell us that not only did it rest on the mountains, but that the water in verse 5 decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Ten months in the ark already. God remembered and God caused everything to decrease. And in verses 6 to 12, we have Noah tested to see if the waters had abated. It says at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window. That's a different word, window, from the first one. It meant opening. He opened a window of the ark which he had made and he sent out a raven. A raven's one of those unclean birds. It's usually a black bird. It's a strong bird. And it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. In other words, it never came back. And right between this verse and the next verse is where his wife comes up to him and says, why would you send out a raven? (laughs) Meaning that, wrong bird. It doesn't say that. But it says in verse 8, he sent out a dove to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, so she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her, the dove, and brought her into the ark to himself. So then he waits another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark, And the dove came to him toward the evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So no one knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. Didn't return. And verses 13 and 14 tell us the water dried up. Came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. It's interesting to note the word covering of the ark. That covering is the same word that's used for the covering of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was covered with, well, animal garments kind of thing. And so he rules it back. He removes this covering. It makes me think it's not a hard covering. It's not a wood covering. But he looks out and sees that the surface of the ground is dried up. And verse 14, it's in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. One year exactly. It's dry. And God commanded Noah to exit the ark in verses 15 through 19. Exit. God said, go out of the ark. 
First, your family, you and your wife and your sons and your son's wives with you. Eight people are sent out to repopulate the world. God's do-over. In verse 17, now bring out with you every living thing of all the flesh that is with you, birds, animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth. And we have the command again, be fruitful and multiply on the earth. And Noah obeyed. He went out, his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. And verse 19, every beast, every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. By their families kind of makes me think that uh, some of those animals were creating little animals while the year was going on. Go out. I go back to the simple theme of this message is God saves lives and God destroys lives. That's correct biblical theology. God saves, but God also destroys. Why do I bring that up? Because what God did in Noah's day, he has promised to do again. Here's what it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. Peter writes to the people of his generation saying, Know this first of all, that in the last days, meaning the days before Christ's return, the last days, mockers, people who make fun are going to come and they're going to mock And they follow after their own lusts. They live for themselves. And they say, where is the promise of his coming? Where's the promise of Jesus Christ coming? For ever since our fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And Peter writes, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. That's the the flood of Noah's day. But by his word, again, the word of God, by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men, meaning mankind. God is a holy God. He's a just God. And one day he will judge the ungodly. But God is also a long-suffering God. He puts up with a lot of ungodliness for a long period of time before judgment comes. And in the same passage in verse 9, it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise, about his promise to return. As some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Isn't that a great verse? The reason why the Lord hasn't come and why judgment has not fallen upon this earth is because God is long-suffering. He's patient. He's waiting for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ to repent. And repentance means to change your mind about Jesus that he came to die on a cross to pay for your sin, that his shed blood while he was hanging on the cross was paying for sin, that he was buried, that he rose again from the dead, and that only through Jesus Christ can you be saved, can you be cleansed, can you be forgiven of your sin. Only through Christ. But you have to turn to him in faith. You have to turn to him trusting in him as your Savior and Lord. So will you repent and surrender your life to Jesus? As I was sitting here singing, the Lord brought to mind a passage in 1 Thessalonians where Paul is writing to a church of believers in Thessalonica
where it says in verse 8, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, from the church, and not only in Macedonia and Achaia, which is two provinces, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. And to wait for his son, Jesus, from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That's Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. It's only Jesus who can rescue you from God's wrath, which will come. Paul preaching to the Greeks in Athens, he says this in Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere, everywhere, that means here too, right? Everywhere. That they should repent. Because God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. That's talking about Jesus. There's coming a day that God has fixed that you don't know when it is, but God's fixed this day where Jesus Christ is the one who will come to judge the world. Paul writing to a pastor named Timothy says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and part of verse 2. Paul says, I solemnly charge you, Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge who? The living and the dead. And by his appearing, he's coming, and his kingdom. So Timothy preached the word. See, I have that call on my life. Preach the word. Don't preach your ideas, Bob. Don't preach what people want to hear. Stick with the Word of God. Because the Word of God is what's living, is active, is sharper than any two-edged word, sword. It's what changes lives. Your wisdom won't change lives, but God's wisdom will. So let me close by preaching the truths that we've learned from God's Word today. First, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back and he will judge the living and the dead. Secondly, he has not returned yet because God is patient. He's waiting for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. God's patient. God's not desiring for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And third... God's long suffering will one day end. And the day of the Lord's judgment will come. So 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord's not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And the very next verse, verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. That day of his judgment will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Judgment is coming. And like Noah who was saved because of his faith and then he acted on his faith and obedience so you too can be saved from the wrath of God through belief and obedience in Jesus Christ. You can be saved. In John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son, that's the Son of God, that's Jesus, has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Obedience is the outcome of true faith. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you will obey. You don't obey to be saved. You obey because you have been saved. 
But there's coming a day when the wrath of God comes. Eight people for a hundred years, a preacher of righteousness, and the world says, I don't need you, God. All the intentions of my heart are on evil continually. But when the flood started coming, they changed their tune, but it was too late. Scripture is clear. God is waiting for you to come to faith in him, in Jesus. And I'm surprised how many people say no. No. But when the wrath comes, it's too late. This passage about the flood to me is very sobering. Because yes, God is a God of love. He demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus, he died for us. He is a God of love. But he's also a God of judgment. We don't like that part, but it's true. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, you know our hearts. You know about each person in this room or watching online. You know if we've repented and turned to Jesus Christ in faith. But Lord God, if there is one, one person in this room or watching online who has not put their trust in Jesus for salvation, may they do so right now. May they repent, surrender to Jesus Christ. The scriptures say clearly, Lord, that all sin, all fall short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, but it's only through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I pray, Lord, that there is someone right now saying, Lord, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And I pray that they're throwing themselves on Jesus saying, forgive me, cleanse me, be Lord of my life. Lord God, one day, I don't know when, but you fix the day when Jesus Christ will appear. And so the day of salvation is now. And I pray that each person here has received Christ. And that another day might not pass before they do so. If they haven't done it already. Lord, your word is clear. May we act upon it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As our praise team comes out, I'm going to ask you if you have any questions at all about whether or not you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and you have a question about that, well, you can come talk to any of us right here, these three guys, they're all pastors, and we'd be happy to show you from God's Word about eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you've already trusted in Jesus Christ, but you haven't been baptized yet, and you want to take that step of obedience, well, sign the Friendship Register or sign on the sheet that's out there in the commons area that I'd like to get baptized. I'd like to make the proclamation before others that I follow Jesus Christ. And I'll send you information about baptism and how you can be baptized on May the 5th, two weeks from today at 6.30 at night. Are we ready to sing another song? Okay. All right, if you're able, could you please stand and join us as we sing our last song?
Thank you for your goodness. Uh, Lord, we pray that as we leave this place this morning, uh, that you would go with us, that we would continue to build, build our lives on you. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, fill us with your spirit. If there is anyone here that uh, is still wrestling and wanting to know if they should turn to you, God, I pray that you would speak to their heart, encourage them, Holy Spirit, move them, draw them close to you. God, thank you for, for coming after us, for pursuing us and drawing us to yourself. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.